Not ready. Go for it. I want to introduce your pastor, Pastor Johnson. He will be doing... <laughs> I guess not. Okay. Anyway, um, don't know where to start as far as <clears throat> meeting Pastor Johnson. We met him. It was... I thought it was 2000, was it 2014 or 2010? Were you back here by 2010? is when you came to visit us. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. It, it's been a long time, and it took me a while to recover from meeting you and spending time with you. And Same so, here, brother. I understand. <laughs> I'm doing it. No, you're not. You're just trying to say that to save face. That's okay. <clears throat> but uh, no, it was all. It's always been something. You're raised in the, you know, us in a Polish Catholic neighborhood in Chicago, uh, you know. And then as time came along, you know, it, it became mixed and all that stuff. But you, you still grow up. You're with your relatives. You're with um, things like that. So you still, even though we were, you know, my great grandparents came from um, Poland. My grandparents were born in America. They were raised in America. Uh, I'm an American, and so, um, and I will always be. But uh, there is that part of us that does, years and years and years ago, come from Poland. And so a lot of the things that we did around holidays and things like that, um, <clears throat> we did do a lot of the things, ate a lot of the food that was Normally Polish. My grandparents, I remember their olive-colored refrigerator, freezer. The double door as you walked in their house. It was right here. It was that nasty olive color. I don't know. I don't know if it's coming back around or not. But they would have pickled pig's feet in there. And that, you know, they would have, they had the pickled herring in there. They made charnina. You know charnina? Am I saying that right, brother? Duck's blood soup. I know what it is. I just don't know the name of it. That's, that's what I knew it was. It looked like a giant pot. If you could take and squeeze Hershey syrup into a giant, I mean, it's a pot. It was a big old thing. I mean, it's more than if you like made chili for a football team. It was a big, and they had it simmering on the stove, and they asked if I wanted some. And uh, if it, I, I, I'm, I mean, if, if it was hot chocolate, that'd be great, but I've never seen hot chocolate made like that, except in the, in the winter time, but this was not the winter time. And it was foaming on the top, you know, sort of, you know, just different. And do you want some? No. What is it? Just have some and I'll tell you what it is. Oh, now I know. If they don't tell you the name of it and what it is, you know they're gonna get you with something. And so, it went around a little bit, and finally they said, it's Charnina. I said, that's good. I still don't know what it is. And they said, it's duck's blood soup. And so it's a soup made with duck's blood, and they, whatever, I, I didn't have it, so I would never know what it tastes like. And so he still had some of those things. My grandparents, they did speak a little bit of Polish. I did not know my great-grandparents. They might have been alive for maybe one or two years, I might have been just, you know, one, two, three years old while they were alive. And so I didn't get to, to meet them, didn't know the language. They still spoke some things. I think it's what they didn't want us kids to know. And uh, then they would talk it. But uh, and so that was always there. So was, there was always a desire to want to go to Poland to, you know, at first it's, oh, I want to go to Poland. I want to see what's there. And again, you think that was I was born in 67. So they were not a country yet, really. When you think about it, they were under the control of the Soviet Union, the USSR, not even Soviet Union, and uh, just just wicked control. And so, <clears throat> you know, it, it wasn't until the later years, you know, growing up and then having a desire to want to go there. But then as you get saved, as you heard my testimony, I didn't get saved till I was a, a youth pastor. Now, I wasn't Terry Angel's youth pastor, but I was the youth pastor of our group that came and uh, we went to camp, and after he preached on that Wednesday, he was kind of preaching about salvation and about knowing for sure you're saved and how I, I, I did not know that. And I knew in my heart I didn't. I went to four years of Bible college. I went to one year neighborhood Bible time. 
um, where we traveled around and preached the gospel to teenagers and kids. And, and still, I knew something was wrong. I knew something was missing. And I think deep down inside, I do think the devil was trying to manipulate, make me think I was saved so I wouldn't get saved. And so there were, but there was always that doubt. You can have a, and it wasn't every service, but it was the majority of services wherever salvation was preached. I'd walk away saying, I'm not saved. I need to get saved. And then all of a sudden, you can't do that. You're the youth pastor. What do you mean? Everyone would look at you weird. Everyone would call you a fake and a phony. You can't do that. And so I went through Bible college, talked to someone about it. And um, I talked to one of the, uh, the men there. I called him the dorm dad. And I knew the first thing he would say is pray about it. And that's true because if you pray about it, God will let you know whether or not you are or you aren't. That's not something he's going to play around with. And so I knew he would say that. So before I went to see him, I said, Lord, I know I'm saved, and, uh, but I'm going to go see him anyway. Amen. And so then we went, saw him. He says, did you pray about it? I said, yes, I prayed about it in a roundabout way. Um, but still, nothing happened. Uh, I never made a decision. Um, a friend of mine gave a, a testimony at graduation about him battling his salvation and wasn't sure he was saved. He got saved as a junior, I believe. And, uh, but still, I would, not, I would not budge, even to the point of getting baptized again, thinking that might have been it, that I wasn't baptized after I made a profession of faith as a 13-year-old, but I really didn't. I didn't know anything about anything. I went forward because my brother went forward. And uh, so it wasn't until that day at camp that he preached on a Thursday night, the last day of camp. And I went forward and trusted Christ as my Savior. Again, at 25 years of age, came home to my church, Garfield Ridge, got baptized. And then it wasn't too much longer after that, God called me to Missouri um, to work as a youth pastor for a few years. And then from there, back to Chicago area, we started a church in the suburbs and then ultimately merged with another church, um, tried to make it a Baptist church. Things didn't work out. And then ultimately God led me to Quincy, Illinois, where I've been for the last 18 years. But God has always, you know, there's, there's a difference between a burden and a calling. And I hope you folks, as you look at your missionary letters and you see the missionaries back there, that you, you get a burden for those people. That you just get a desire that if God were to have you go, you'd go. But more than likely, it just doesn't happen. It does happen sometimes, but if everybody went and became a missionary, where would the churches be? There'd be no churches. There'd be nobody in the churches. And so you have to have good, solid people in the churches. And, and, and that's a good thing. And, and, and so, but to have a burden for those people when, when, when you read one of the missionary letters or one's posted, you can't wait to get over there, see what's going on, see what's happening. Have a burden that way. Or right here, also have a burden to see soul saved, to see people uh, come out to church, friends, relatives. Um, oh, by the way, that, that fella at the hotel room, I gave him one of the cards. And I, I said, here, here's an invite tomorrow. Invited him out. And I found out that the Trinity Baptist in Austin wasn't Austin, Texas. It was Austin, Indiana. How would I know? How did he know? But we got that straightened away and um, everything was fine. But um, still invited him out. And you just never know. You get a burden for people. If you know you have uh, relatives, maybe it's you know children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, whomever it may be, parents that are not saved, you get a burden for them Amen. And, and pray for them and fast. And as I told the one church, I said, if everybody just prayed, fasted, and worked on just one person this year, it would double. Yeah. And I know it sounds simple, and I know it's kind of, you know, I say the same thing. Yeah, that sounds simple. You know, I've seen that on the hair care commercials. They'll tell two friends, and they'll tell two friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, but it is true. And that's just one person a year. That's all, you know, um, and it could be more than that. But in John 8, 12, the Bible says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. Can anyone tell me? And since we have no young people in here, usually I have the young people answer. They know everything. 
Wait, we have a young person? Teenager? No? Hey, does she know everything? Or does she tell you she knows everything? No. But, um, ooh, Italy. Is that it? Wait, is that Italy, Indiana? No, Italy, Italy. Oh, wow. Buona. Huh. The good restaurant we go to. See, I'm going to start getting off on tangent, brother. The restaurant we go to, the guy's from Italy. He's from Sicily. And uh, I think, anyway, I'm not going to get into the mob and things like that. But <laughs> you have to understand, also growing up in Chicago, I wanted to be part of the mafia. And when I heard there was, I'm, that's just me. That's just what I wanted to. That's why I named my son. His middle name is Vincent. So I could say, hey, you don't straighten up. You're going to see Vinny. And my daughter played the violin. So she would be there with Vinny. And she would play a tune on the violin if you're not careful. So we had it all worked out. And I'm living my life and my children. What? But it is the best authentic Italian restaurant that I've been to here. He, he doesn't like Chicago. He likes Quincy. And so... I just don't say I don't like it because I'm afraid what will happen if I say I don't like it. So, anyway. But what is the light of the world? Can anyone tell me? Yes, but what is? If you, if it's just a simple, what is to us the light of the world? Now, physically, not, not spiritually thinking, the sun. The sun shines on us. When we're asleep, it shines on other people. It shines all over the world. You can't get away from it. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He's saying, I am come for the world. I'm not just coming to the Jews. He came for the Gentiles. He came for everybody. He came so that all could believe. But then if, so Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. We'll read four verses, and we'll notice what it says here. Jesus is saying, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. If you like salt, my dad loved salt. We never had to worry about salt until he moved in with us. And in two years, we went through most more salt than we had, I think, the entire time we were married. Uh, we just don't use it as much. But if it doesn't have that flavor to it, it's no good. I'll, you know, give it to us. We'll throw it out in front of our church when it snows. And it'll help melt the ice and things like that. But if it has lost its flavor or savor, it's no good to be eaten. But notice verse 14. Jesus says to those he's teaching, he says... Ye are the light of the world. Uh-oh. Jesus is the light of the world, but then he's telling not only his disciples, but the believers, he's saying, you're the light of the world. We have a responsibility to imitate Jesus Christ and to be the light of the world, but he doesn't only do that. He says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. He's not only saying, you're the light of the world, but let's shrink it down. You're the lighted city. You're a city that cannot be hid. Well, let's take it even further down in verse 15. He says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it giveth light into the whole house. Let your light so shine above before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. A candle, a city, the sun. It starts small, and then it gets bigger, and then it gets bigger yet. And Jesus says that's to be us. The believers, that's us. Anyone want to guess how many people die each day worldwide? Take a guess. Worldwide, every day, how many people die? Brother, you want to try? 
Three million, okay, that, that's way up there. Nope, not quite, that's good. Most people were low when we started playing the prices right. But um, 166,324 die every day across the world. So you're able on a, on a website to look up in Poland, 1,140 people die every day. Worldwide, every year, it would be 60 million, seven, over 700,000. 60 million people die every year worldwide. In Poland, every year, 416,100 die every year. And if I want to look at that as far as for my own sake, that's approximately the size of three cities that we're looking at after we go through language school. And we'll talk a little bit about that, hopefully at question and answer time, um, what our plans are when we get down there. But uh, some of the cities we're looking at, if you take the population of those three cities and combine them, it's like wiping those cities off the face of the map every year. That's the number of people that die in Poland, 416,000. And yes, people are born. In Poland, it's not the same rate. There's more people dying right now in Poland than are being born. And you know what happens to that after a while. But of those people that die, how many are saved? How many of those, say, yearly, worldwide, 60 million, 700,000, how many of those people are saved? You know the Bible says, narrow is the way that leads to heaven. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there go in there at. How many are lost? If we think about that, does it move us at all? Do we care? And I would say probably as a person, if somebody were to say that to me, I'd be like, unless it really affected me, unless it really did something in my little sphere, really wouldn't think much about it. But the fact is, there are people dying. There are people that have died from COVID that I know. There are people, uh, the first teenager in, because teenagers, it didn't affect much, but the first teenager in Illinois that died was a friend of mine's daughter. She had other complications, a lot of other complications, but she was the first teenager to pass away from the complications of that in Illinois. So, yes, I did know some, but last year there were two people that died in, uh, in our church. And you think of, well, these people are going to live forever. They're never going to die, you know, or they get kind of sick and they're like, pastor, we know you're leaving, but, but, but are you going to do my funeral? You know, that's one thing they, they, they want to know about and things like that. And, and we did their funeral for both of them. Actually, Patty reminded me that it was the anniversary of her death um, last uh, Wednesday. And so, um, you know, the fellow that I talked about in Sunday school, his niece or his wife's niece, that uh, their baby was born uh, full term, but was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around um, her neck. Um, thing was, that's the same man, his sister committed suicide. That was the anniversary the same day of his sister doing that many years ago. So, you know, things like that affect him more. I know his niece, his, his wife's niece, a little bit. I knew his sister even less. But it affected him in a great way. But I think God does want us to be concerned. When he says we're the light of the world, he puts no bounds where we can be moved, where we can be touched, where we can have a burden. We need to have a burden across the world. But notice he doesn't stop there. He brings it down to our city and says, we need to have a burden here in our city. He even goes even closer and brings it down to our own homes, to ourselves, and says, you're candles. I'm not going to preach the whole message. I'll give you mainly the points. But the Bible says we're to let our light shine. There's no different from me being up here than you sitting down there. There's really no different other than God's called me to go to Poland and reach the Poles. God's called you to reach the people of Scottsburg in this area. Believe me, I, I'm, no missionary that comes up here is anything special. 
You may think, well, they're leaving home, they're leaving this, they're leaving that. No, we're just going to the people God wants us to reach. You're going to the people that God wants you to reach. And if you'll be faithful, and I'll be faithful, guess what? We can stand before God, receive our crowns, receive our rewards, and be able to take them and lay them at the feet of Jesus. He blesses faithfulness. Because if I'm supposed to be in Quincy pastoring, but I'm in Poland as a missionary, guess what? I'm not faithful. I'm out of the will of God and I'm doing something he doesn't want me to do. But if you're here just being faithful, doing what God wants you to do, guess what? There will be that time you get to stand before him and you get to stand before Jesus and he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He doesn't say, well done, thou good and faithful missionary to Poland. Never says that. Well done, thou good and faithful servant to, I know a few in um, the uh, Muslim countries. Uh, one in Egypt that, um, you know, it, it, it's dangerous. One in China that's dangerous. One in um, Iraq that's dangerous. And their life could be snuffed out at any time, depending on who they meet and who they talk to. But if they're not supposed to be there, and they should be in Chicago, guess what? They're not being faithful. They may be doing something, but guess what? They're not in the will of God. I just want you to understand that if you look at a missionary that stands up here and presents his burden, he's just presenting another place to share the gospel where God has led them to. We're to be candles. Candle is to light the house. We must have a burden for our family. Amen. And if there's any place to start, and, and that's why I wanted to start small before we got out. If my family was not what it should be, there's no way I could have a burden for Poland. Right. I just couldn't. My heart would be with my family. My heart would be with my daughter. My heart would be with my sons and my daughters. I praise God that he's, he's been gracious and he's been favorable to us. <coughs> and having my children, my two daughters being uh, Christian school teachers, you saw the one up there, the first one, she's in Cambodia for a year, teaching English to Cambodian children in the Christian school at the church there. Then she'll go back to Las Cruces when she gets home and continue teaching there at the uh, Christian school in New Mexico. My other daughter, the next daughter, she'll, she's in um, Ohio. And she's teaching uh, at a Christian school there in Urbana, Ohio. My one son just became pastor of our church. He was voted in at the beginning of the year. They kicked me out and voted him in. How do you like that? That's why I'm here with Brother Johnson. I'm living at his house because I was kicked out. Oh, I didn't talk to you about that. I need to talk to you about that, brother. You know, I saw you had a basement. She could be here to play piano. Think about it. Wait, it's with him. <laughs> That's okay. But when you think about it, and then my, my son, the other pastor, then my other daughter, she just works as, in the bakery department at Sam's Club. Sunday school teacher, just being a lay woman in the church. I guess that's a term. I don't know. Lay person, lay woman, lay man, lay woman. There's only two genders, so. Um, and then uh, my youngest son, he's in Bible college, 19 years old, studying to be a pastor, whatever God would have him to do, but he knows he wants to pastor or um, be a youth pastor. But boy, if my children were in the world or my children were wayward or something, you know what? There would not be a burden for Poland in my heart. My burden would be for my kids. And you know what things happen? Like I said, God's been good to us and God's been gracious. And everybody's story can be different. And if you have uh, uh, you know, children that, that need the Lord, that need to be saved, don't stop praying for them. There's your burden. There, there's, there's where your heart can be. You can pray for them and you can fast for them and you can ask God, God, do a work on their heart. God, that's what I do for Poland. In praying for Poland, it's no different. My neighbors, pray for Jerry. Jerry's my neighbors two doors down and he's been out to church and he's come to, to visit, but he's not saved. 
Pray for me that I would have the courage. Pray for me that I would have the gumption, whatever you want to call it, to go there and tell them about Jesus Christ and not be afraid. It's good to be a nice neighbor. It's easy to invite them out to church. But you know what's hard? Hey, Jerry, do you know for sure if you were to die, you'd go to heaven? I know we talked about it. I know I preached about it. Why? Because, man, maybe I don't want to offend Jerry. He's my neighbor. I won't be able to get the tools I get all the time. You know? And so I don't want to ruin that friendship. I need a, I need a burden. I need, I need the courage to go from God, courage from God to go and talk to him. And the same would be for, there, there's a, a woman, uh, at least she was a woman, and she's the manager of the Sam's Club. But her name is Lacey, and she changed it to Lace, and she's married to another woman, and they have adopted children. But I try to be a witness to her. I want to see her get saved. I want to see her come to know Jesus Christ. We invited her out to church. I don't think she's ever been out to church, has she? But, but she knows where we stand. When my daughter wasn't off on time on a Wednesday, she, she was real apologetic. She was like, I tried to get her off. I tried. You know, she knows where we stand. We never worked on Sunday. We never worked on Wednesday. They were in church. And I could have a burden for her. I don't need to go to Poland to have a burden is what I want you to see. I could be right where I'm at. But I have to understand God's called me there. Will you pray? Will you teach? Will you be an example to your family, to your friends? But then there's also, as it goes out, the city. Candle, but if you put it, as the Bible had it, when you think of walls in the cities of, of the Bible days, um, think of, okay, I gotta think of her name now. Ah, Rahab. Rahab the harlot, and that's where the spies went to, and uh, she had a, a room or a house on the wall of the city, and uh, when, when they came to inspect and find out where these men were from Jerusalem, she let them stay up on the top, on the roof, and then when the guards passed, she let them out through the window when they were able to escape. She let them down by a cord, the Bible says, through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. So what would happen if all these houses around the city on the wall had candles in their windows, because they couldn't flip on a switch, if you were coming to that city from miles away, what would you see? You would see all these candles in the, in the windows. You would be able to see the city. It was a city set on a hill. It couldn't be hid. It wasn't in the valley covered by trees. It was up on that hill. And God says, we need to be a city set on a hill. And who's that? It's our church. We could be this city set on a hill, group of people together, letting everybody know who Jesus Christ is. We're not saying that we're more talented. We're not saying we're better than anybody. We just have the answer when it comes to death and hell, heaven and life. We know Jesus Christ. I give the illustration of going from the Indian Reservation in Arizona when we were on a missions trip and we had to leave quick to get back. And so I think it was a Friday night. We traveled back after the, um, I think it was like nine o'clock we traveled back because they had an evening VBS, and so we're traveling back, and we're coming on Highway 40, 40, and there's Albuquerque, and we're coming close to Albuquerque, but we're still in the mountains, and all of a sudden, the road goes around the mountains and comes down into Albuquerque, and you couldn't really see anything up until then because you were kind of in the mountains, but as soon as you got around that last mountain, all of a sudden, those that were awake in the car, my wife was awake, I was driving, I was sort of awake. And, uh, but you hit that city and it's like the lights hit you and you were like, where in the world was this city hiding? Because you couldn't see anything, but all of a sudden those lights hit and you're up here, the city's down there, but you saw it. Why? Because all the lights of the city were on. It was like you're going through Chicago, but obviously it's not. It was that city, so you, you, you couldn't see it. And that's, that's what we're to be. When people see us, when people see and hear about uh, uh, Trinity Baptist Church. You know what? It's a place that where I want to go. It's a place where I want to be. They don't hear about schisms. They don't hear about fights. They, they hear about a people that love Jesus Christ. Amen. They hear about people that love one another. 
Is your light shining in the city? Do people see? Or what do people see when they see the light from your city? And lastly, we're to shine as the sun. We're to shine around the world. How can we do that as a people? Well, if, if God is, again, if God is leading you specifically in his will, you can come with us to Poland. We'll take you. I tried to get Pastor Johnson to come with us. But he's got to follow God's will here and pastor. There's another guy, that Vasileski or Wazaluski. He's up at the Bible college I went to, but he's at the church there. And he has, uh, I think, about four sons. And I keep trying to encourage him, hey, you want to go with us? But you see those people all on the back. As I was pastor of a church, I couldn't go as much as I wanted to go to the Indian Reservation, the Navajo Reservation. God was not telling me to go there. But boy, if I was able to go there every week, every month, I mean every year, excuse me, I would have went. Other places, the Philippines with a, a friend of mine. But God wasn't doing that. But you know what we could do as a church? We can pray for them. We can uplift them. We can send them, uh, support them financially. We can shine as the sun all around the world. We went on missions trips. Do what well. we went up to Chicago. That was a mission field within itself. I mean, right, the, the park we were in with our kids was right outside of the Nation of Islam. There's the Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan's building. And uh, we were out there till about 9 o'clock at night, 8, 9 o'clock at night, just getting dark. Some places you don't want to be in Chicago. It's a park at like 9 o'clock at night. But we were there, didn't feel afraid at all. Just enjoyed being there, enjoyed being on the Navajo Reservation, enjoyed going to Mexico once, going to Poland. We can shine as that sun. We can, sun never stops shining. Some we could say we should never stop shining. In other words, we're not one way here at, home, at church and then another way at home. Another way at home and another way at work. We're all the same. We're shining. And the thing with that is people are going to see it. We're an epistle. We're a book that people read. But you know what? There's coming a day when the sun's going to stop shining. The Bible says that, okay, this way. The Bible says that when we die, when, when, when we're in heaven finally for good, that there's going to be no need for the moon or the sun. God will be the light. Jesus Christ will be the light. There'll be no need for a sun. There'll be no need for a moon. You know what? In the end, when it's all over, when we're in heaven, if you're saved, there's going to be no need to witness. There's going to be no need to be that light. We'll be perfect. We'll have our glorified bodies. But there is a time and there is a need, and that's now, that we need to be that light. We need to be the light of the world and shine to all, get the gospel to all the world. We need to be that city set on a hill. As a church, let people see the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even down closer, we as individuals need to be a candle. Just one. A candle can do a lot. Even though it's just one, but man, when you put those candle flames together, it gets bigger. But each candle is important. Each one here is important to God. And God would love for us to be that light shining in our families, in our homes. I are the light God wants you to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. And we ask God that you would just bless the invitation, Lord. We Thank you for loving us to give us something to shine about. Without you, Lord Jesus, we'd have no salvation. Without your gift of eternal life, we'd have nothing to tell the people in Poland about. We'd have nothing to tell our neighbors about. We'd have nothing to tell Scottsburg about. Thank you, Lord, for giving us something to tell them about. Thank you for dying on the cross and loving us. May we shine. For you, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me, please? What is it God's spoken to your heart about today? You have heard a very clear message, and I hope you were listening. Each of us need to be a light in our homes, in our families, a light for Jesus.
reflecting a lot of Jesus in our, our families. We need to be a light to our community. We need to be a light to our community. And then all together, as a community called the local church, we need to be a light to the world. Shine the light of the gospel. The gospel is what God has given us to share with others that can make a difference in their eternity. Are you willing to share that with others? Even if all you do is invite somebody to church, that's a start. Anybody can do that. So please, let's get serious about this thing of living for God and sharing what God has done for you with other people. If you're saved, if you're a Christian, then you know how to tell somebody else how to be a Christian. Just tell them what you did. It's not about being baptized. It's not about being a church member. It's not about being a good person. All those things are important, but that's not how you get to heaven, is it? No. You got to trust Jesus Christ for salvation by coming to God, asking him to forgive you of your sins because of what Jesus did, not what you do. And God will forgive you because, based on what Jesus did for you. Turn your life over to him. Let's do that. Now, Miss Lisa's going to play. And I'm just going to ask us just for a moment, and I mean a quick moment, she's going to play one verse of a song while we bow our head and close our eyes, and that's for privacy so that each of us can talk to God individually. Because talking to me doesn't fix the problem. You need to talk to God just like I do. Let's talk to him now, and let's listen to him, and let's obey him, whatever it is he's spoken to your heart about. If you need to be saved, right now is the time to do it. You put it off, then Satan has won the battle. Don't let him win. If, you've al if you're already saved, if you're a Christian, then let God have his way in your life. Whatever it is he's challenged you with today, let's obey him. Amen? Let's pray. And as I finish the prayer, Miss Lisa will start to pl uh, play the piano. And that we, we have time to do business with God before we go. Okay? Father, please take this time and use it. I pray that you'll receive the glory and the praise for what you're working our hearts about right now, that each of us will choose to say yes to you for whatever it is we need to do. We thank you in Jesus' name.